Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, ambassadors, uh, friends. Uh, very good to see you all um, on this beautiful sunny morning. Uh, I think uh, for Sam Zonloft and others who've brought some nice Middle Eastern sunshine to Brussels. I'm not going to. I'm not going to mention that. I'll, I'll introduce him in a minute and tell him tell you about him who he is. Um, here at SEPS, my name is Jim Moran. I'm a associate. Uh, senior fellow here, uh, former EU official. I was ambassador in Jordan, Egypt, and other places uh, around the world. And when organizing this, I was reminded uh, when I was in Jordan, uh, Jordanian ambassador is with us today. Very nice to see her here. I was reminded 20 odd years ago um, in Amman, having a conversation with a very senior European negotiator who will remain nameless, um, but I think you might work out who it is. And he just got back from the Taba talks, if you remember, at that time. Uh, and he was very depressed. He said, we've come so close. The Palestinians have more or less agreed. Uh, the Israelis also. And then everything fell apart. And he said to me then, look, he said, I think that's it. It'll be decades before we get back to this position once again. The reason for the failure of Taba I'm sure those of you who follow these events uh, know, of course, it was a lame duck of the American administration. It was the end of the Ehud Barak time in government there, um, and it was simply wasn't possible to push it through. But it showed you that you're not going to get any solution, at least uh, in the foreseeable future, without a major international effort to support it. And since that time, cycles of violence have occurred time and time again, and we're in one of them right now. And it's pretty tragic to see what is happening with some 200 or so people killed, mostly on the Palestinian side, of course, which is always the case, um, and many cycles of violence in between. There is, seems to be no real peace process to speak of. Um, the two-state solution, to use an old phrase, I think, uh, at best, uh, is dormant, if not dead. Um, the perspective uh, ahead is a worrying one, above all for the Palestinian people, but for uh, the rest of the world as well. Uh, the situation is not good. Um, and uh, the perspective uh, is full of clouds. Uh, and uh, it would be good to know um, whether we've got any chance, uh, as an international community, uh, of supporting some sort of process that will get us out, get everybody out of this very destructive cycle that's going on at the moment. Just yesterday, there were more deaths uh, in the West Bank, uh, and uh, the perspective is not, as I said, good at all. Anyway, that's enough from me. We have a great panel of speakers uh, to discuss this with us today. Uh, starting with Ambassador Hussam Zomlot, he is the Palestinian ambassador to the United Kingdom. He's come over to be with us today from London. Uh, he's got uh, a pretty long history um, of uh, service uh, in the Palestinian Authority, and prior to that, he was an academic in uh, uh, Beit University, and uh, also at Harvard. And uh, he served famously as the uh, Palestinian ambassador in Washington at the time of Mr. Donald Trump, when Mr. Trump, in his wisdom, decided to close the mission, and he had to live through that. And after that, uh, he came to London, uh, where things are, I hope, slightly better, if not worse. I'm not sure to say. But anyway, he's great to, great to have him here. And he will start us off. He'll be followed by Evan Inser, who is the um, <coughs> Vice President of the uh, Delegation of the European Parliament for Palestine, uh, MEP since 2019. And we'll finish off with some comments from Vladimir Janicek, who is with the Middle East Division of the uh, EEAS, the European External Action Service. And so uh, without uh, further ado, Sam, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, we can get started. So again, welcome. And uh, very nice to see you here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the evening. Uh, good morning, uh, Ambassador James uh, Moran. Uh, what a great pleasure, really, and an honor to uh, be here among you uh, and among this very distinguished uh, panelist, a very old and good uh, friend, uh, Veen, and in the presence of Vladimir uh, from the External Services. And uh, allow me first really to uh, recognize the presence of many friends, His Excellency uh, Dr. Abdurrahim Al-Farrah, our ambassador here 
uh, in Brussels um, and the Jordanian ambassador, the Tunisian ambassador, and all uh, many good friends here. I, I, I hope we have something to, to share uh, today, but this will be more of a conversation. But by way of introducing the situation and uh, <coughs> following your lead, um, uh, James, I think I, I need not to say how dreadful the situation is uh, uh, on the ground in Palestine. Um, Evil just returned from a trip, and many of you have been there recently, even more recent than, than us. <coughs> but the situation is both um, uh, uh, acute and chronic in every sense. Chronic for we, what you just heard since Napa and before, and acute because every once in a while, as recently, things pop up. You all have followed only a couple of weeks ago a very uh, serious uh, situation in Gaza. You, you followed what is happening uh, all over the West Bank. And of course, you follow the very intense situation in Jerusalem particularly. Um, uh, and yet we are on track again this year to, to have a record, a new very sad, unfortunate record of the highest uh, Palestinians killed since UN record uh, began already. We are not even halfway through the year, and we're talking about 156 Palestinians killed in the occupied territories, 110 of them in the West Bank alone. Uh, uh, <coughs> of course, including Khadr Adnan, I'm sure some of you followed his case, the hunger striker, the prisoner, uh, who uh, was let to die uh, uh, after 86 days protesting his detention without charge, without trial, and for the 10th time. And um, uh, I'm sure you, you're following the mushrooming, unprecedented levels of settlements this year until May, i.e. five years on, and we have 7,000 settlement units being announced, approved by the Israeli coalition government. You have followed the recent uh, legislation cre clearing the way for the resettlement uh, of uh, four uh, settlement outposts that were uh, vacated by the Sharon government in 2005, including Homish. Uh, I'm sure you have followed that very dangerous, unprecedented development. And we have seen the EU strong uh, statement about that uh, particular case. We will come to it later. Um, and of late, according to the United Nations, the West Bank now uh, is, is divided into 166 separate uh, uh, islands, cantons, antostans, find the right term for it, completely separated by checkpoints, walls, you know, uh, uh, and all uh, that you know about the military system of control. <coughs> the policy of demolition is continuing at, uh, at pace. Uh, Israel has demolished, seized, or forced owners to demolish 50 Palestinian-owned structures, including homes in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, displacing some, some 90 people, including 45 children. All this is the last few months. It's not talking about a record. Uh, <coughs> and uh, an EU-funded school were demolished among the structures only recently. I'm sure if you've seen that, you've followed that. More than 1,100 people were displaced in Gaza in the last aggression uh, uh, and bombardment that happened earlier this uh, this month. Entire villages remains at risk of demolition. I'm sure you have followed the Masafir Yatna, but elsewhere, entire villages are uh, slated for uh, complete demolition. And the financial support for the Palestinian institutions and the UN institutions like UNRWA is, uh, is declining at a very, very dangerous uh, rate. Uh, the World Food Program is warning it may have to suspend services in Gaza for lack of funding. This is very serious. This is very, very serious. And UNRWA has already declared <coughs> very recently that it is, its nose is coming underwater. Uh, and you know, uh, 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 for instance, I'll give you a number. Uh, UNRWA uh, uh, service 500,000 Palestinian uh, uh, school students, pupils, 500, half a million. Gaza has 80% of its population refugees, including myself. So this is not just another organization doing another job. This is a lifeline. Um, <clears throat> and I can go on, but you know, the situation is dreadful. Hasn't been as, 
as difficult as lacking horizon, as deteriorating steeply as it is uh, in the last uh, few uh, months and perhaps uh, continuing from last year. The Israeli coalition, can we still call it the new? It's not new anymore. But the Israeli coalition, and I need not to go further and quote for you what Bezlal Smotrish says or what uh, uh, Bengvir does. Uh, it's all over. You, you, can, you can see uh, how uh, lawlessness, uh, 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 racism, uh, utter denial uh, uh, is their name, the name of their game. I, this is not such a very prestigious policy, home and house. Uh, uh, the uh, SEBS should not be the place for that. But it is the place to quote for you the uh, 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 clause in the coalition agreement when it was established, it was signed by Netanyahu and all the coalition partners. In that coalition agreement, I read, I quote, the Jewish people have an exclusive, exclusive right on the land from the river to the sea. The land from the river to the sea, exclusive rights. That's the coalition agreement. Furthermore, in the coalition agreement, it stipulates that this government will give, will double down on building the illegal settlements in the occupied West Bank, including East Jerusalem. That should have been because it's contractual. These are not just statements, you know, hot headed uh, 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 words in a conference in Paris, like Bezlal Smotrich, and in front of him, the map of Palestine and Jordan, for that matter, not only Palestine. But that was the contract that, on which the government sits. So that is part of the relationship with the external world. And the reaction by international actors was absolutely dismal. And failure, failure at all levels failures uh, to deal with such a challenge because, you know, it's in your face. No longer uh, hide. You know, all previous governments were much more clever in hiding the real intention. But they were not even interested in hiding it. They were hitting you, slapping you in your face. Reaction by the U.S. was negligible, and we'll talk about it later in the conversation, by Europe. What is this that... Europe doesn't deal with Bengvir, but it deals with the government. On what basis? H how does that policy work exactly? So our problem is with Bengvir. You see that, that, but we received the foreign minister of such a government that uh, signed such a, a clause. <coughs> and we received the prime minister and all that. It was such a failure and a slab in the face of all those who still issue statements after statements about the two states, about the illegality of settlements. Such a slab in the face of the so-called Abraham Accords, <laughs> because those who signed the Abraham Accords told us they're doing so to enhance, to promote, to incentivize the two-state solution, to stop the settlement activities, to protect Jerusalem. Seriously? And I can go on, on the list of failures of that moment when this government was formed with such a contract. Now, <coughs> I have very quick three points to make after describing where we are. First point is, Palestine is a Europe issue, Vladimir. It's a Europe issue, first and foremost. It's a Europe problem. In every sense, it isn't an American problem. From Zionism, which started here, not here exactly, it's where I just came from, in England. Darby and the whole dispensational theory, it's here. The Jewish question is here. Israel was created here. The Balfour Declaration. The Venice, uh, I'm sure, uh, all that followed, I'll, I'll come to it later. But the Balfour decla Declaration.
Yes, I speak. The San Remo, all that became part of international law. From 1917 to 1920, Europe decided on our faith, and we still live the consequences until this very moment. Five years, 1917, Balfo, to 1920, the San uh, Re uh, Re Remo uh, Accords, and what is in between Sykes-Picot, have become almost the ceiling for the people of Palestine. I served as ambassador to Washington. I engaged the Trump administration. Their document was just an extension of the Balfour Declaration. But the Palestinian people have no collective or national rights. All we can grant the Palestinian people is the right to pray some seven rights. And I'm sorry, we have to talk at one point about that moment of colonial arrogance. Arrogance that still lives with us until this very moment, 105 years on, and we still live the consequences of that European decision-making process that has altered the fate of the Palestinian nation. <coughs> and to go on, the two-state solution also is a European thing. The whole thing about the two-state solution. Let me remind everybody, the PLO, which I represent with honor and pride, so does His Excellency Abdurrahim al farah our platform until the 80s was one democratic state. صح? That's our platform. That's who we are. That's our DNA. It's a small, beloved piece of land. Let's all live together. Under one constitution, one arrangement, equal rights, we do not separate or distinguish according to race or religion or creed or color or height or width. That was our platform. That was the Yasser Arafat platform, the Palestine National Movement platform. The two-state solution was purely a European thing. And I remember, because I dig the files, I worked for Fatah, I, I, I was, uh, we met there when I was the deputy commissioner with a great commissioner, Dr. Nabil Sha'at, and that history. By the way, Dr. Nabil Sha'at was the first Palestinian to write an article in 1969 about the one uh, uh, Palestinian democratic state, equal rights for everybody. Now, and I, I dig how the European engagements in the 70s and early 80s was with the Palestinian leadership, with Yasser Arafat, with President Abbas at the time, and with all the colleagues, from Bruno Kreisky to Willy Brandt, who told the leadership at the time, adopt the two-state solution and we will deliver the rest. So, the two-state solution was a European idea, and it was not a Palestinian demand. It is important to make that point clear. It was a Palestinian concession to Europe. Europe. <coughs> and there was a huge engagement between Europe and us in that, at that time, in the late 70s. Oh, the exchange of letters between Bruno Kreisky and Willy Brandt and many other leaders. And please dig, those who are interested, dig into that record. You see how much Europe was engaged, how much Europe was concerned, how much Europe wanted to uh, convince us of the two-state solution, not only for the love of Palestinians and Palestine, but also for the love of Israel. Because Europe, and by the way, social Europe cares about Israel at the time uh, more than the right wing, and we'll come to that later. In England, it was the Labour Party that supported Israel the most until recently and the violations of human rights. <coughs> and at the very same time, in the early 80s, the Venice Declaration, 1980, happened, which really but the first real concrete sort of track for the two-state solution. And at the time, Europe gained the initiative from the U.S. all the way. And by the way, at the time, Israel and the, and the Mossad was in panic. Tomorrow, the 1st of June, marks 43 years since the assassination of our ambassador here, Khadr. Huh? Naim Khadr, yes, Ambassador Naim Khadr, who was assassinated a few meters away from here because he was the 
PLO, Palestinian representative in Brussels, in the heart of the European Union, engaging all these circles towards a two-state solution. So the resistance to a two-state solution by Israel started long ago, and not only by words, but by bullets. And Your Excellency, we should really mark that, and we should honor Khadr Adnan. And, and not only Khadr Adnan, our ambassadors in Rome, our, in, in Paris, there was a, an assassination spree by the Mossad of our ambassadors here. Because exactly that, because Europe was engaging towards a political solution. Our ambassador here did not involve in any other activity. <coughs> and I can go on, but the history is long, but it's crucial to frame it. And the only time we have managed to do a peace accord, Oslo, it was not in Pennsylvania. It was here in Europe. It was here in Europe. That's why I started by saying this is a European thing from A to Z. If I was in Washington, I would say from A to Z. But from A to Z. <coughs> Huge investment I can attest to in the 90s, the 1993 and what followed by Europe. I mean, Europe invested heavily in the nucleus of the state that was the Palestinian offer, heavily as in billions, as in real investment in building the tracks, the tracks of the two-state solution. And, uh, you know, I, at the time I was working for the UN ONSCO, United Nations Special Coordinator's Office. At the time, that office was mandated to actually uh, 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 help building the nucleus of that uh, state. And I, I could see the European engagement and investment and goodwill, real goodwill. <coughs> and I don't need to tell you the geopolitical, the, the, the significance of Europe and the Middle East, of Europe and the Southern Mediterranean. Who am I to tell you about the security ramification here, the economic side of it? It's huge. I mean, we border between Gaza and Cyprus is 40 kilometers. That's it. So while, while the US has been leading this whole effort, it's Europe that is affected the most. And it is us that is affected by Europe the most. So <coughs> I wish I have more time, but I'll have to go to point number two. And point number two is the EU approach of late, the moment the European Union and the Euro Europe in general, Europe diplomacy, Europe politics, Europe strategy materialized in Oslo, and it was just at the beginning of uh, a new world order in the early 90s, it completely conceded all that history to the US, and then went to the White House to sign the Oslo Accords, and since then, it has taken many steps behind the US, when in fact, everything since or before was purely European. And the US has taken complete exclusive role, monopoly, over the peace process from 1993 until this very day, regardless of the level of engagement or initiatives, but it has become an exclusive role of the, of the US successive administrations. And in the meantime, you know, Europe is just waiting for the U.S. to come up with initiatives. Europe statements always call for the U.S. to do something. W why? W what does the U.S. have more than Europe to offer? The biggest trading partner with Israel is not the U.S. It's the, U it's the European Union. Am I correct here, James? Or the biggest donor to the Palestinians is not the U.S. It's the EU, Vladimir. <coughs> and of course, this whole balance, and I don't, I'm, I'm not in the mood to hit hard on the whole balance thing. Every statement we hear, you have to balance it with something about the Palestinians. The two-sidism. You, you, you have to find something, you know. Something for what? There is an, <laughs> an occupied and occupier. A colonized and a colonizer. A besieged and a besieged. You cannot equalize that. You cannot, in any form or shape, make that a balanced 
<coughs> I'm, and I'm talking about the last few years and the association agreement with Israel and then uh, uh, you know reactivating the association council please please ask me about it later because I have few things to say so the whole approach since the failure of the Oslo Accords and you know the reasons of the failure one thing Israel never intended never intended to achieve a real two-state solution from day one from break one from the first stone from the first concrete that was built in the occupied territories after 1993 oslo accords we should have taken action we didn't we didn't we started the oslo process with 125,000 illegal colonial settlers how many of them are today 750,000 in the occupied west bank including of course East Jerusalem. That approach, my friends, that has lasted for years, balance, two sidism, uh, you know, uh, uh, shared values with Israel. What are these values? <laughs> no, seriously, what are these values that we share with Israel? <coughs> carrots and more carrots. Let's embrace Israel because if we embrace Israel, Israel will just come around. Let's not. Israelis are exception. This is. By the way, this is a racist. This is a racist state, a statement. When you say Israelis are, uh, they are not exception. They are not like they are not. They are like the Belgians, the French, the Palestinians, the Saudis. They are just like all of us. If they don't have consequences, if they can have the cake and eat it too, they will behave in the way they have been behaving. There are no exceptionalism about Israelis. <coughs> so that did not work for many years, and it will not work. My my last point. We need a new approach. And that approach, if we, to salvage whatever left, I can describe it as enforcing, enforcing the two-state solution rather than calling for it. Khalas, we've done enough of calling for the two state enforcing the two-state solution. First, recognize the state of Palestine. This is not a Palestinian demand or uh, a gift. This is an overdue right that should have been done in the 80s. The moment Yasser Arafat and the Palestinian leadership, the late president, our, our father, announced, declared the state in 1988, 15th of November, that moment should have led to the recognition, to level the field. <coughs> Number one, recognize the state of Palestine. And every country that does not and fall short to do so is not serious about the two-state solution. Because recognizing the Palestinian state is not the outcome of a final agreement. It's the entry point. It's a contribution to the two-state solution. And all those who argued otherwise, it's an outcome, are, are, are just not interested. <coughs> sign, negotiate, and sign an association agreement with Palestine, Vladimir. What are we waiting for? What are the two states? Uh, uh, if you want to be a duck, walk like a duck, act like a duck, quack like a duck. <coughs> and I know His Excellency, our ambassador, told me about the inspiring conversations about this. Our prime minister was here very recently, and that discussion happened. We need to do it. Because the alternative, if you don't recognize the state of Palestine and you don't really sign uh, an honorable in, uh, uh, representative agreement, representative of the history I've just described, association agreement with Palestine. The alternative, you de-recognize Israel and you repeal the association agreement with Israel, so you level the field. So it's your choice. You level the field by recognizing one side or de-recognizing the other side. I think de-recognizing is nothing we expect from Europe at this point in time. Number two. Or three. Let's undermine the economic feasibility of the illegal settlement. Let's do that. What is this labeling business? I hear, I read, I follow that this many years old, it was finally approved in 2015, but the labeling was endorsed by the European Union in 1997. 1997. And the European Court of Justice, the, the High Court of Justice, have absolutely ruled that every state of the European Union must adhere to the labeling. But first, labeling is such a, uh, 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 such a bad policy because 
by labeling you are throwing the onus on the consumers, on your citizens, when in fact these illegal products is a responsibility of the state, so it is, and it must be banning, not labeling. But even labeling, I learned or learned that only three states so far in the European Union adhere to the labeling. What is this? How are we going to undermine this beast called settlement? And why aren't we banning? Does the EU label ivory products? Do we label ivory products? We don't. Anything that is illegal is banned. So, so about the companies. I mean, many European company, companies go and profit in these illegal settlements. In, in, in the UK, we have four of them, and I'm sure you've seen the list that pr was presented to the UN, including European companies. This is a straightforward thing. The EU, with its official bodies, must absolutely have clear guidelines that this is illegal. EU citizens who serve in the Israeli army or live illegally in these illegal colonies, what about them? Israeli settlers who live illegally, extraterritorially, in, in the occupied territories, do they have the right for a visa waiver to the European Union? Do they have? Does that agreement that extended visa waiver to the Israelis who live in, inside Israel extends to those who live illegally outside Israel? If you really want to undermine the economic feasibility of the settlement enterprise, these are very practical steps, and nothing of which would be not in line with EU policy, with EU law, and with international law. It will be an impl implementation of all those. <coughs> Thirdly, support the, our efforts at accountability. I mean, when, we, when the Palestinian leadership decides to go to the ICC, this is not just kicking and screaming like children. We want to stop the next soldier or, or officer from pulling that tr trigger, or the International Court of Justice. We want the uh, uh, hearing from the highest judicial authority about the very legal status of the whole Israeli presence in our territory, in our lands. Or the UN Human Rights Council, it was established to make sure that we care about our human rights in a, in a, in a, in a, in a collective multilateral manner. Why is it that key European actors vote against all this? W why? What is, the log what is the policy logic? So please, at least if you can do much, do not obstruct our efforts at creating accountability because believe you me, those who believe in, in, in your hearts that peace must be achieved, it can only be achieved through accountability. Nothing hurts peace more than the lack of any sort of accountability. Number five. Yes, please support our democratic process. Do support our democratic process, our democratic institutions. We have done wonders together in the last 25 years. And we are so proud of that. The institutions we have built, the elections we have convened in 1996, and I was there and I remember, in 2006, and the last attempt last year. But please understand the sensitivities. And please don't, you know, hold that as if it's a gut you moment. You must understand our sensitivities. There was no pressure on President Mahmoud Abbas to convene elections last year. Nobody mentioned that. I can attest to this. Not London, not Washington, not Brussels. We need elections. It's a, it's a, it's a requirement for us. <coughs> but not President Abbas, not any Palestinian president, would record in his history or her history that they can convene elections without Jerusalem. This is real, especially in light of what Trump did. This is serious. Go see what is happening in Jerusalem as we speak. The Israeli authorities, government, is absolutely in a state of, what's the word? Sara. To pocket Jerusalem. So at this time, at this moment, we exclude 350,000 of our people who are the people of our capital. So we need to understand our sensitivities. It's crucial and work together because building these democratic institutions is absolutely vital. And then lastly, we need to support peace culture. Yes, peace culture. It's important that we support uh, peace culture in Palestine. But please, let's not 
conflate that with all the propaganda that we keep hearing uh, 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 about uh, <coughs> incitement in our curriculum. And, you know, that we have to teach a certain. Let me be very clear here. We will only teach our kids the truth. We will teach them that they were forced and uh, the Nakba happened. And we will teach them that they are under military occupation. Israel li likes that or it doesn't like that. We don't give a damn. And we will not. We will not teach our kids something according. <laughs> we will not teach our kids Zionism. We will not turn into uh, a mass Zionist movement. And I, I follow the debate here about this incitement. And our box, according to your own institutions, are at the UNESCO standards, are at international standards. I hope the European Union have the guts to go and see the Israeli box and to be balanced there instead of just go see the Israeli box, text box, and see the real incitement. And I am personally proud because we have followed. There were a couple of graphs that were removed by, by, by mistake here and there, and it's good to constructively, but the overall exercise, <coughs> Ambassador uh, Moran tell me I have to conclude, and I know I must. Um, <coughs> losing interest, my friends, in resolving the Palestinian-Israeli issue, as Europe has shown in the last few years, losing interest doesn't make the issue go away. It doesn't. It just makes it harder to resolve in the future. And it makes the issue of, of apartheid that you are following from all international human rights organizations. There is a consensus now. And your foreign ministers keep asking this question if the two-state solution is still valid. So there is that pressure. And I, I believe in Europe. I really do. I believe in Europe. We believe in Europe. Uh, we have, we are committed, the Palestinian leadership and people are committed to our contractual agreement, committed to a state of Palestine on the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital, committed to resolving the issue of refugees in accordance with international law. We are committed to the tracks, the solid tracks we have built together over the last 25 years, committed to everything that we have signed for until now, despite Israel, and regardless of Israel. But if, if, if all the above doesn't work, we need to really think together. Europe <coughs> might really want to think deeply about what's next, including focusing on rights and stopping our rights being in a freezer, waiting for a political solution, if that political solution is not pushed for in the right direction, as I described. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Hussam. That was a pretty encyclopedic uh, presentation of the situation as seen from, um, uh, from the Palestinian point of view, and I think uh, we've all learned quite a bit of that. Thank you so much. Many, many points. I'm not going to waste any more time. I'm going to give the floor immediately to Ebin, who has just returned, I think, from the regional, was recently there, and can tell us a bit more. One thing in particular raised by Hussam, amongst many others, the state of democracy, not only in Palestine, also in Israel, must be a preoccupation for parliamentarians here and around Europe at the moment. Tell us more about that, if you can, amongst other things. Over to you, Evin. Well, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to attend this uh, discussion, which always is uh, uh, important, especially also uh, related to what Hussam ended up with, the interest for the issue. It cannot... Um, uh, uh, it can, we cannot continue seeing this decline, unfortunately, I must say, of interest uh, for, for uh, a solution uh, on uh, the situation. And um, a couple of years ago, people were using the term status quo. I'm happy that I don't hear it so often. Why I'm happy is because that has never existed. But why I'm sad, of course, at the same time, because um, uh, w what hasn't existed, stated quo, has meant, of course, that the situation is getting worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and um, this, uh, and the interest to uh, find a solution has not increased. We can see it even in the European Parliament. I would like to actually start with uh, the, uh, the discussions that are taking place in the European Parliament, and then I will also come back to uh, my recent trip uh, in, in Israel and Palestine. 
um, in the European Parliament, many of the issues that have been discussed and is discussed, that has been on table, is on the table, is also related to, to what Hussam mentioned. One of the issues that always, year after year, comes up on the table is issues of the textbooks. And I, mm, I, can, I will be the first one to say that, of course, we need to do everything we can jointly to ensure that the violence stops. But we also, when we use argument, the argument needs to be valid. The EU, a couple of years ago, made this um, report, uh, independent report by George Eckert is uh, Institute, uh, German Institute, that clearly said that those big allegations against the textbooks and against UNRWA, because UNRWA was the main target back then, and now the focus has been from UNRWA to the PA now, uh, is that, um, that actually the Palestinian textbooks adheres to UNESCO standards and there has been improvement the last years. But also, as Hussam said, one important point that has never been addressed is how does it see, how does it look in the Israeli side? I actually asked my, uh, one of my Israeli friends, how does the textbooks, uh, Israeli textbooks look like? And he said, look, even I looked at my, uh, my youngest child's uh, uh, textbook and Palestine do not exist there. When we talk about two-state solution, for example, where should the border go? Uh, when we talk about um, uh, if we don't then respect the 67 borders. I mean, if we demand from the Palestinians to have Israel in the textbooks, which I think we should, we should also demand the Israelis to have Palestine in the textbooks because every demand that we have on one or the other should be equally on both sides. Otherwise, we would never be able to be trustworthy on our demands. Um, uh, Nevertheless, this discussion has back, been back and forth at least since I started 2019. And instead of looking at how can EU uh, take its share of responsibility on pushing the two-state solution forward and the peace negotiations, we are every year in the parliament, and a pa a parliament ending up to di uh, discuss if UNRWA should have money or if UNRWA shouldn't. Not, uh, and I get surprised every year because I do not understand those colleagues of mine who thinks that there will be positive consequences of holding in money, freezing money to UNRWA. Who will gain on that UNRWA do not continue uh, getting the financial support or the PA? It will only be extremist powers, forces who will win on it. If we really want, a, if we deeply really want a two-state solution, we need to strengthen those uh, forces in the both societies that actually want a two-state solution and we should act on it, not undermine the possibility for two-state solution. I mean, during a certain time, actually, a half a year or something, uh, I think it was last year or the year before, when we held, if we froze the money to the PA from the side of the uh, European Union, what l did it lead to? It led to the Palestinian didn't even have access to, for example, cancer treatments, because the Augusta Victoria Hospital in Jerusalem didn't have financial support to continue running the hospital. So it's not only an organization, an UNRWA, or uh, the Palestinian authorities that we are talking about. It's people's everyday life and people that are taking the consequences of our actions here in the European Union. Um, and I must also say uh, that uh, the, the, the I'm disappointed on some of my colleagues, or many of my colleagues in the European Parliament, but I'm also disappointed as the Commissioner Varheli, who has been actually leading this uh, work on trying to um, do everything in order to um, uh, hold in the money from the PA and uh, the money for, uh, for UNRWA. I do not understand more than that I've come to the conclusion that he's actually not an EU commissioner, he is Orban's commissioner. That's very clear for me. Because a big majority of the European Union member states actually reacted to this behavior and said, enough, continue giving the support to UNRWA, continue giving the support to the PA. Nevertheless, 
we had it on the table this year again. So the story goes on and on and on. So these conversations, I think, are very much important uh, to, in order to, uh, to shed the light on the, cur uh, the situation, uh, also in the European uh, Union. In parallel on uh, a weakened European Union and a, a European Union that actually not only have abdicated from its share of responsibility to uh, pushing a uh, uh, two-state solution forward and the negotiation forwards, we see, um, uh, we see a European Union or we see an Israel right now connected to uh, the question that you, just, uh, you, uh, you uh, had, who is actually on a backslide on democracy in the country. This backslide, of course, is affecting the Israeli democracy as it's also continuing um, uh, uh, the heavy um, uh, oppression of the Palestinians. I was, I think it was one or one and a half month ago when I was in uh, Tel Aviv, I was there to support um, my sister party, the Labour and the Meretz parties both parties in their struggle for democracy, uh, democracy in Israel. But one thing that I really was very disappointed at when I, uh, uh, when I, uh, I uh, was uh, observing uh, the demonstrations, I was I'm impressed, I must say, that it was so many people that every week for so long have been on the street. But one thing that I was disappointed at is that the occupation was not there. It was just a few people who maybe had the, uh, was uh, demonstration, uh, demonstrating in, uh, against occupation and understood actually the connection between the deterioration of democracy in the country and with the continuation of, uh, of uh, the occupation because they are very much interlinked. Instead of taking so much money from the Israeli um, taxpayers and putting it into settlements. It should go to the everyday Israeli um, people in Israel. It shouldn't go to settlers and settlements areas and expansions of settlements. I myself right now, the uh, rapporteur uh, in the European Parliament for recommendations to the European uh, Commission uh, and uh, including, of course, uh, the EAS uh, through the uh, High Representative uh, and the Council on the relations with Palestine. Some of the issues actually that you have uh, mentioned, uh, Hussam, is as it is right now in, uh, the, uh, in the proposal that will be for, up for vote in uh, the committee in June. Uh, some of those is actually included. So a few of them is, uh, them is, for example, that European Union needs to be able to shape up, to dare to say, enough with the demolition and confiscations. A simple thing as, as that. It's even the demolition and confiscation includes actually our European Union taxpayers' money goes to building infrastructure and uh, housings and different kinds of projects, which is of course important for ens to ensure the Palestinian people to live as decent life as possible under totally undecent circumstances. But nevertheless, what happens? The Israeli military destroys them. It's not even when it concerns our own taxpayers' money, we dare to say to uh, the Israeli authorities, enough is enough. We want back every single cent that you have destroyed and confiscated. Not even that. But we are prepared to accuse the Palestinian for one thing or the other, even if it's true or not, we do that. So I think we need to start, um, start actually uh, being, uh, being fair to both sides. Whatever demand we have on one side, we should have on the other side and vice versa. And then also, w and another important thing I actually think uh, in, in the recommendations as they stand right now, I hope that they will go through, is that we say sanction those people that is behind the expansion of uh, settlements. That would be a huge step, I think, that we, for once in the European Union, would dare to use the same mechanism that we use towards other, uh, other countries. I mean, the Russian, the Russian, awful aggression against Ukraine. It has been important that the European Union have acted against Russia jointly. But if we should be 
trustworthy. And we really uh, say that we uh, take the struggle uh, in, uh, for, for international law. Then we also need to highlight and, uh, or raise our voices wherever international law is violated, regardless of who it is who is violating it, who it is that is being violated. We need to stand up for international law and demand end of impunity by those that are, uh, that are um, violating uh, international law. And I would also myself, of course, as coming from Sweden and belonging to the Social Democratic Party back in 2014, my, uh, my country uh, uh, recognized um, uh, Palestine um, and we had hoped to see uh, that more countries all through Europe would do that, uh, European Union would do that. Unfortunately, we didn't see that, uh, that um, uh, effect. But I am at the same time disappointed that the new far, uh, it's not the center right, it's a right, Far right, right and far right government. What I, have they done? They have cut down on the development aid with, I think, over 40, 70 percent to Palestine. The humanitarian aid is there, but development aid has been cut down. If we then say you need to democratize your institutions, you need to have a free, fair elections, and so on and so forth, and you need to work more on gender equality. How do, do we then think when we are cutting, uh, uh, cutting down on the development aid that is actually there to help build um, and strengthen uh, democratic institutions? That's an essential part of, of uh, building uh, or facilitating and helping out. Uh, and uh, I, I also know that some of those uh, in government right now uh, in Sweden, if they could have chosen, um, they would have withdrawn, unfortunately, the recognition by the uh, social democratic-led uh, government uh, back, uh, back in 2014. But nevertheless, I hope that we will be able to join our forces and to put pressure on the member states, on the European Parliament, myself and my colleagues, to, uh, to uh, not only not... Uh, becoming silent, but also choosing the right path forward. Thank you. Thank you. I know you have to leave a little bit earlier, so at this point I'll stop and say, if anybody has specific questions from the audience, or especially for Evine, please ask them now, uh, because I don't think she can stay with us more than another quarter of an hour or so. Anybody got a question? Madam, over there, the lady in the second row in the blue shirt. Thank you. Um, we had two more hands up, I think. Um, there was a gentleman here next to you. Yes? Yes, sir.
Yeah, the key word is hope. We're looking for a bit of hope here. Uh, third and last is Brian McDonald. Brian at the back there. Okay, thank you, thank you, Brian. Um, I think at that point we better stop and come back to Evine to make any response because I know you have to leave. So, Evine. Do you want me to start with what I had to say or questions yes, or? Okay, so thanks a lot. And first of all, good morning to all. My name is Vladimir Yanacek and I'm from the External Action Service. I'm the deputy head of division dealing with Palestine, Israel and, and the map. So we are division specifically dealing with these issues, very specific division. Uh, I mean, a lot has been said already, so I won't repeat all that. Um, there's a lot to say and I think clearly it's a very fascinating subject. And I think all, the, all this means to me is that there are many people who still care. I mean, there are many different views on how to solve the conflict, but what I also will take away from this is that there are many people who care, uh, 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 and so do we. So where do we stand? What I thought I could do, because I'm not going to um, 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 go into historical um, analysis, but what I thought I could do perhaps in two, three points, first look at how we actually look at the situation, what in our view is, is the assessment and what are the areas of our focus and maybe concern. Uh, and then in the second phase, maybe I could say a little bit what, what we are trying to do in terms of de-escalation, but also in terms of working with the parties, but also trying to look, look ahead and what, what we think could, could happen in, in, in the longer term. So first of all, I think on, on the analysis and on the assessment, I concur with what has been said in, in, in many ways. I think we are now 30 years from, from Oslo and I think it's a good question that he's asking, what is there hope? Um, I, I don't know, um, but there are certainly ma many things that uh, we find very concerning. Uh, first of all, I think also an, at a very human level is the sheer level of violence that we have seen this year, but that also builds on the trend that we have seen last year. Uh, we have seen already over 100 fatalities on the Palestinian side, um, record levels in terms of fatalities on the Palestinian side last year, but also over 20 fatalities in Israel following the terrorist attacks. We have seen uh, a number of security incursions in the West Bank, again, that follow the terrorist attacks. We have seen some escalations um, in Gaza uh, this year, quite recently. We have seen last summer between uh, Israel and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad which we have also seen in 2021 with, uh, with Hamas. So that's, that's, that's one uh, thing that, where, that we are looking at. The other, I think we have been quite also concerned with the increased tensions um, as we have seen in the build up to the religious holidays, which this year as last year have, have coincided. Um, and so that of course always raise additional stress and challenges to the status quo, which for us always is something that has to be watched quite quite carefully. Um, and of course, we have always emphasized the importance of the status quo, specifically to the holy sites. I know you have referred to the status quo, but here I think it's very important. Of course, we always emphasize the special role uh, for Jordan here. Uh, third, and, uh, and I think as has been said already, the settlements and, and demolitions, uh, we have been quite concerned. Uh, the, the Homesh outpost has been already mentioned. Um, and we have uh, followed that quite Closely, that's quite concerning also because that, that uh, follows the reinstation of the disengagement law and also other, other housing units. Demolitions and uh, displacement, we have also been quite vocal in the school in, in Samia, but also the destruction of the school in Jebel Hadi, uh, where Israeli authorities have declared that it's not safe and therefore decided to, 